It was the wildlife of Central America which first took us to Belize. We planned to spend four months exploring its jungles, studying and filming the monkeys and the birds. We were also hoping to film those rare sea mammals, the manatees. Or watch fish on the second largest barrier reef in the world. But one way or another, we found our thoughts more and more being drawn to the mysteries of the great Mayan civilization of thousands of years ago. Whichever animal or object we found and filmed, all seemed to have some connection with Mayan times. That's an amazing thing. Can you imagine some Mayan blowing that over a thousand years ago? Try it. That's amazing. Our base was Belize. It used to be British Honduras, a tiny country with but few good roads. Ford Young, a local naturalist, gave me my first view of the country while Anne took care of provisions. The coastal area of Belize is flat swampland and mangroves. Moving west, the ground rises slowly, giving way to scrub forest and jungle. Once across the coast, we dropped down to fly low over the rivers. These rivers cut across Belize in a number of places and were until recently the major system of communication. Ford made a pass over two of the few remaining Jabiru stork nests in Belize. For ease of landing and takeoff, these huge rare birds nest only in the tallest trees. Further inland, I saw a system of lagoons. These flooded areas act as a reservoir which fills in the wet season and drains slowly into the lowlands in the dry. The most important reason for this flight, though, was to try and locate a manatee, and Ford kept a sharp lookout on the way back. The manatee, or sea cow, is one of the rarest and most elusive of all aquatic mammals. There was something in the river below. It looked like a huge log, but then the outline became clear. It was a manatee. We circled for another pass. There, under the bank, were four or five of them. I knew then our greatest challenge would be to film manatees underwater, perhaps at sea where they're rarely seen and no one has filmed them before. All this time, Anne was back in the city of Belize, stocking up for our expedition. Unlike the rest of Central America, the road signs and advertisements are all in English. Even the architecture is Caribbean. The only giveaways are the Latin faces, Spanish and Indian, in among the Black Carib and West Indian an amazing mixture of races and religions. More than once, this city has been hit by hurricanes. In fact, it was virtually leveled by Hurricane Hattie in 1961. While Krob was getting together the material needs of our expedition, my job was to organize the food. The Belizeans have devised ingenious ways to peel oranges. They seem to be addicted to them. The market was fascinating for me, a totally new experience. Smells of fresh fruits and vegetables were everywhere. Ginger by the boxful. I just had to touch everything. I inspected, felt, weighed, then bargained. It was an exciting change from supermarket shopping.
beautiful papayas were just one of a whole variety of locally grown tropical fruits. And they cost only pennies compared to their prices elsewhere. All the market waste was thrown into the chocolate-colored water, where it was devoured by catfish in a frenzy of feeding. I certainly wouldn't want to swim just there. Now, in February, our first task was to drive to the Mayan mountains where we hoped to find a particular bird, the oropendula, who weaves a hanging nest reputed to be up to five feet long. Our journey took us into the great watershed area where the scrub pine forests of the foothills give way to the thick jungles typical of Central America. We set up our camp in a clearing directly beneath a giant tree in which the oral pendulas built their nests. The colony above us confirmed everything we'd heard, including the burbling call of the male. The birds had chosen their nest site well. Next door was an amapola tree, one of their favorite feeding grounds. Here they'd sip the flower nectar in a surprisingly delicate way for such large birds. We had learned that the giant Saiba tree was sacred to the ancient Mayan inhabitants of the area, for it supported their heaven. But majestic though it was, its height made detailed filming of the Oropendola impossible. Our only chance was to try another known site over a hundred miles away. We headed across the border into Guatemala, for the site we had been told about was in the ruins of the ancient Mayan's greatest city, Tikal. We had no idea what to expect, and as a result, were perhaps unprepared for Tikal. We had come to find birds, and found instead a magnificent city. We were in a kind of daze as we climbed one of the massive pyramids to look for our birds. Sure enough, our informants had been correct, for there, just a few yards away and at our level, was a small oropendula colony. We'd failed to film them high up in the sacred Mayan trees and instead found success on an ancient Mayan temple. Our first dawn at Tikal was magic. Here in the jungle, well over a thousand years ago, the mines built these monuments to their gods. When Europe was in her dark ages, the Mayans had reached the height of their civilization. They had the most advanced writing in the Americas and mathematics that allowed them to count into the hundreds of millions. All this, it would seem, to keep track of time, for time was their passion.
A bat falcon reminded us of our job. With a new day beginning, the jungle was coming to life. A keel-billed toucan. Mealy-headed parrots, the jungle's loudest inhabitants, squabbled continuously. Below, two wild oscillated turkeys, perhaps the Mayans' most coveted food and a source of decorative feathers. Once, they may even have been domesticated. Peccaries, too, were used by the Mayans, both for food and for bristles, which made excellent paintbrushes. It was the sounds that fascinated me. I'd never been in the jungle. It was so thick, I couldn't see through it, but its sounds made it really live. After our last experience, filming the Oropendal in Belize, I couldn't believe how close we now were. This big male was the dominant bird in the colony. Bowing with wings spread and yellow tail displayed is characteristic of the male and serves as a courtship call amongst other things. From time to time, he would jump about the colony checking out the nest the females were building. As far as we could see, he was the only male around. Each time they returned with nest material, the females would force their way into the opening, making it larger. In another part of the colony, one female had just begun construction, carefully preparing an anchor which would hold the long hanging nest. The weaving is as intricate as a basket, passing each strand in and out of the vertical ones and knotting it at the end by repeatedly passing it through. The same kind of weaving is used in the anchor, usually spread between a fork of branches. This scraggly looking female suddenly came into the colony and began tearing the nests apart for no apparent reason. She wasn't building her own nest, she just seemed destructive. Finally, the big male chased her off and checked out the damage. When a bird had completed her nest, she would line it with bark, stripping it off branches nearby. Fascinating as the Oropendulas were, we found ourselves being drawn more and more into the mystery, the enigma of the Mayans. It seemed that everything we did was associated with the ancient Maya. Even on these stones, the delicately carved figures are decked out with the feathers of birds that are still around today. Some of Tikal's temples are perhaps the highest in all the ancient Americas. This is the temple of the giant jaguar and was built over 1,200 years ago. The great enigma of the Mayans is what happened to them? Where did they go? When Columbus arrived in the New World, these temples were already being reclaimed by the jungle. 
It's only recently that archaeologists have cleared them. What natural catastrophe, disease or insurrection, caused these cities to be abandoned? Or was it a combination of all of them? The Mayans' obsession was time. They believed careful study of the past foretold the future. Most of these carved stones, called stella, had dates inscribed. One fixed a point in time some 390 million years ago, long before man. Just two weeks before we arrived, archaeologists unearthed a grave and discovered this conch shell. Shells held deep religious significance, as did anything coming from the sea. These stingray barbs, found in the same tomb, were used for ritual bloodletting, particularly by piercing the tongue. I think I'd rather skip that part of the ceremony. Fishing, shell collecting, hunting manatee and turtle were activities of the coastal Mayans. This temple mural is probably typical of hundreds of villages that made a trade network stretching 1,500 miles from Yucatan to Panama. Warriors and merchants traveled in canoes like these, a reminder that we had also come to explore the coast, and perhaps we'd find a Mayan connection there, too. Our first objective was to film the offshore schools of Black Snapper. But most of the fishing boats were sheltering in the harbor. If the wind continued, there'd be no fishing or diving outside the reef. My only previous glimpse of the reef had been on my first aerial survey. The barrier reef is the second longest in the world. And to see the fish schooling, we'd have to dive on the outside of it where the bottom in many places drops away almost vertically. But our main problem was going to be the wind and the surf pounding on the reef. Our boat passage to the schooling area would take us south, sheltered inside the reef past lovely small islands. This fishing village, perched on the reef, is a thriving community for just two weeks each year in January. It's then that the groupers school. But now, in March, we were to head further south for the Black Snapper. We set up camp on a beautiful little island called Buttonwood Key. It was still blowing too hard to dive, and no fishermen had arrived in the area. The Snapper were supposed to school at the time of the full moon. We still had a couple of days to spare, but even if the wind dropped, the sea would probably stay rough. At last, one fisherman arrived. Perhaps he felt a change in the weather was coming. I didn't have the fisherman's instincts. What I needed was a weather report. So we headed for the fisheries research trawler, which was here to observe the fishing and had a powerful radio. The calm water under our keel belied the heavy seas outside the reef. The best forecast in the area comes from the American Coast Guard station on Swan Island, about 600 miles away. They broadcast each day at noon. As the Shibari National Weather Service in Miami, the Caribbean Sea synopsis, a high pressure ridge north of the Caribbean will move little through Saturday. The forecast for the northwest Caribbean Sea, easterly winds 15 to 20 knots through Saturday, seas 4 to 7 feet. A few showers. This concludes the weather broadcast for the day. HRK 6 Charlie. This one radio will be on the air tomorrow at 12 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was hopeless to try and dive outside, so we decided to explore the reef itself. Very few sections of this reef have ever been explored, and though we felt disappointed in not being able to dive outside, we were excited about what we might find here. This reef is typical of the Caribbean. Brain coral, staghorn, rose coral 
are a few of the hundreds of corals that seem to thrive here. One thing we noted was diseased coral. This brain coral is being eaten by a black band of bacteria, which destroys the tissues. This has been reported in Bermuda, 2,000 miles away, but as far as we know, no sightings in the Caribbean have been publicized. I swam over this before realizing what it was. Hidden under perhaps 200 years of coral growth was an old ship's cannon. It could be Spanish or English, and we marked its location for the future. I startled a big stingray cruising slowly behind the reef. As I swam closer, I could only think of the barb nestled in his tail. It would be about the same size as the one from the Mayan grave. I don't know how the Mayans caught these huge fish. They probably harpooned them. Dinner was easy for us to get. Crawl would catch a fish, and I would gather some conch. These shells house a delicious animal, which has been used since Mayan times, both as food and bait for fishing. This small conch was exactly like the one from the Mayan grave. Again, we'd found a Mayan connection linking us with the past. Aboard the fisheries boat, conch was being broken out of the shell. First a hold is made at the base of the animal's muscle. Then the muscle is severed, allowing the animal to be pulled from the shell. This method has changed little since Mayan times. The brown semicircular bit is the animal's foot and means of locomotion. The black stalks its eyes. Back near our camp, we found piles of conch shells, which show that this island has served as a base for fishermen over a very long period. The fishermen, too, had failed to get their snapper. But their philosophy was, if not this month, then next. The moon was full, but for three whole days, the wind had not let up. There was no possibility of filming Snapper now. So we decided to wait until next month. The next full moon, when perhaps the sea, wind and fish would be on our side. Now it was time to move back to the jungle. Few bridges exist in this part of the world. These men are on call 24 hours a day and no tolls are charged. Actually, bridges would be difficult here for these rivers rise over 20 feet during the rainy season. Our plans were to visit the water bird rookeries. In April, the young were hatching out and the parents were flying back and forth to the lagoons to feed. The first rookery we visited had white ibis and red heron. In the first nest were three red heron chicks. White ibis circled above the rookery. Some of their chicks, which at this age are much darker than the adults, seem to be doing well, but we noticed a surprisingly high mortality rate. The roseate spoonbill rookery was supported entirely by mangroves. Red herons were there too. 
The spoonbill nests were well hidden in the branches and hard to find. Above us, one adult bird called in alarm. As we turned back towards the nest, we suddenly realized that a chick was hatching out. All around the rookeries, we found evidence of shooting, perhaps partly accounting for all the dead chicks. These shotgun cartridges were left by hunters, many of whom we later discovered had shot these birds just for the sake of killing them. It was impossible to think of destroying so beautiful a bird for any reason. The last rookery was the Woodstorks, perhaps the noisiest of them all. The huge birds nest high in the trees, probably because they're not so skilled at flying in and out of the branches. The constant wind, which had affected our diving expedition, was much in evidence here as these enormous stalks fought for balance. The noise of large bird colonies never fails to fascinate me, and these were no exception. The wood stork rookery was shared by cormorants. As well as beautiful white egrets. But soon all these birds would disperse, first feeding in the still flooded lagoons. It seems the storks don't actually migrate in the long distance sense of their European cousins, but they do move about a lot within Central America, and the Crooked Tree Lagoon in northern Belize was one of their favorite places. We rigged our rubber boat as a hide, but somehow it looked more like a new naval secret weapon. It worked though, camouflage was a must, for these birds are hunted and are very suspicious. They would arrive early before dawn and spend the whole morning working their way down the lagoon. The wood storks were amusing to watch feeding, shading an area from reflections with their wing, stirring up the mud for small crustacea with their feet, and picking them out with their long beak. As the lagoons dried up, the birds concentrated where the water depth was perfect for feeding. The great egrets shared the same area with the wood storks. Once they had covered an area, they would then move down the lagoon to a new one. They were impossible to follow. Our movements would scare them. All we could do was guess where they would start each day and anchor there the night before. By now, the Oropendula would have finished building their nests, so we decided to make the long journey back to Tikal. On our way, the sky was virtually obscured by smoke haze. It seemed as if the whole area was on fire. Today, they still clear jungle just as the Mayans did. It's called the slash and burn technique and was considered a poor means of farming until fairly recently when it was conceded that this method is the most effective for subsistence farming. The fields this burning produces must lie fallow for many years between crops. The Mayans believed 11 years to be ideal. Some of the trees are nearly fireproof, like this Cohoon palm. Today, man fells it with a few strokes of a sharp axe. The early Mayans had only stone tools. 
The seeds of this palm make a rich oil, and the husks of charcoal so effective as a filtering agent that it is used in the space program. The results of the fire look like a battlefield. Even at midday, the sun was covered by a smoky haze, and this went on for over a month. Even a short distance from Tikal, the great temples were almost invisible. Now that the dry season was well advanced, the leaves had gone, and the oropendula nest stood out plainly against the bare branches. As if to greet us, the big male bowed continually. The nest we had seen in the first stages of construction was complete, and we could only imagine the young oropendulas deep in its bark-lined bottom. One reason for our return to Tikal was to find the giant head of an ancient Mayan god underground beneath the temple. He was known to the Mayans as Chak, Howler monkeys lived up to their name above us. There were four chocks, one at each corner of the world. They were responsible for rain on their good side, hail, floods, and crop disease on their bad. This dual aspect of chock, being good and bad, is a characteristic shared by most Mayan gods. Spider monkeys shared the jungle canopy with the howlers. It did bother me a bit to think what kind of animals I'd find in a tunnel underground in the jungle. Surprisingly, it was dry, but thick with flies. I heard the squeaking of a bat up ahead. He was flying back and forth between me and the light, which obviously confused him. The left side of this tunnel was actually the wall of some long-lost temple which the mines had built on top of with a new one. I wondered just what I would find. I thought of how long he'd been underground for originally, he was on the outside of the old temple. Chalk was perhaps the most important god in Mayan times, and the water he represents was a Mayan synonym for life. And this, we found, held true today, even amongst the remnant Mayan population. <laughs> An old Mayan, one of a handful that remained compared to the millions that lived long ago, told us he worried about the possibility of a drought, for the rains were late this year. Through an interpreter, he also told us that lack of water was the reason why his ancestors had left their cities and dispersed. The time for planting was critical, he said. The short rains that nourished the corn seed had not come, and he was worried that the heavy rains would arrive suddenly and wash away what they had planted. 
he demonstrated that even with a fire-hardened stick, it was difficult to penetrate the sun-baked earth. Rice, a relatively new crop in this country, is planted close together. Corn traditionally is sown much further apart. According to temple murals, these Mayan huts have changed little in the intervening years. Inside the huts, it was stark and simple. This hasn't changed probably any more than these tortillas, which are cornmeal pancakes. Only the grinder is modern. In the old days, they used stones. Many of the same vegetables, such as gourds like this, were also in daily use by the Mayans. Apart from a few modern utensils, this whole kitchen area is almost unchanged, and so is their key to survival. Water, the essential ingredient for crops, cooking, drinking, and ceremonies, which required a very special water from stalactites deep underground. A great deal of the Yucatan Peninsula has a porous limestone crust. Caves are everywhere as are underground rivers. In some of these caves, we walked for hours, going from chamber to chamber. In many, we found ceilings like a cathedral's. In each cave we explored, we found evidence that the Mayans had been there long before us. Pieces of broken pottery were everywhere. They were probably used to collect water for special ceremonies. The Mayans believed so much in cycles that every 20 years or so, they would break everything and begin again. This accounts for much of the broken pottery we found, and it wasn't until we got to the coast on our way back to the snapper schooling that we discovered more artifacts and the Mayans' clever use of broken pottery. It's an amazing thing. Can you imagine some Mayan blowing that over a thousand years ago? Try it. That's amazing. I can't get much out of it. Look, it's got it's got a man on the back. But he's lost his head. He's lost his head, poor fellow. Hey, it was a child. What did you find? Oh, these are terrific. Oh, look at them. There's bits of pottery. They must be net weights. For fishing nets? Yeah, because they certainly fished around But this hasn't here. even been drilled out yet. Well, they're bits of pottery, and they've obviously worked the hole, and then they didn't complete it. Oh, I'll be darned. And, and the other these, one? these, well, Ooh. they must have tied around them, don't you think? Look at but that. But there's masses of them. Oh, this. I was going to show oh, you Oh, he's that. beautiful. I think it's a manatee. It is. It's, it's a manatee. Be. And you yeah. found him right in the water out here. Great. I got caught between my toes. And the big one. And yeah. this was our most dramatic find, a carved manatee rib bone, perhaps over a thousand years old. It was a dramatic reminder that we still had been unable to get close to the manatee, let alone film them. But first, because the moon was full and the sea was with us, it was time again for the black snapper. We were in luck, for there were the snapper. Perhaps the fishermen who told us to wait a month were right.
We were 70 feet down. Some snapper were milling about, but didn't appear to be spawning yet. Our plan was to try and find more snapper on the narrow shelf between the reef and the drop-off. If we couldn't find them there, we'd descend quickly to a maximum of 180 feet, for the fishermen had said that they may be deep. A school of jacks mingled with the snapper. I felt perhaps we were too early. The snapper were here, but not in the vast numbers that we'd been told about, and always, tantalizingly, almost out of sight. If we lingered about here, it would mean a long decompression. If we were going deep, we'd have to do it now. This drop-off is the edge of the continent. It presents a vertical face to the ocean of over 6,000 feet, a sheer wall. It gives me an odd feeling, even a bit scary, no matter how many times I dive a wall. We were just over the edge, 110 feet down, but there was still no fish. At 180 feet, we'd reached our limit, for at this depth, breathing air, the mind gets fuzzy, and with each minute, our decompression gets longer. But even here, there were no fish. We'd failed again, and I wondered as we surfaced slowly if the constant wind had upset the delicate mechanisms which signal the time to spawn. Our decompression was for only 10 minutes at 10 feet, Waiting, I thought about our final quest, the manatee. Ford Young was our only hope. If he could spot a manatee from the air within reach of our rubber boat, we'd have a chance. We'd found it impossible to film manatee in the rivers, for the waters were opaque. Our only chance was at sea where they seldom go. Ford would circle if he found a manatee. He was circling. It seemed he'd found one. He kept circling to mark the spot while we rushed in. It looked like a big male. He was moving at a steady two or three knots. He hadn't seen or heard us, and every few seconds he'd surface to breathe. It seemed as though our luck had changed. If only we didn't scare him. We drifted slowly in and lowered our anchor. He seemed to be almost stopped, waiting for us. The water was fairly clear, and I knew if I could just get close enough I'd be able to do what no one has done before, film a manatee in the sea. Cautiously, we eased our way into the water. If he sensed us now, he'd be gone and we'd lose him, perhaps for good. I 
I thought we'd scared him, for all I saw was a cloud of sediment. Then suddenly he emerged. The first thing I noticed was that he was surrounded by remora, suckerfish. These we'd only seen before on sharks, rays, and turtles, and even then only one or two. Never the dozens that surrounded this creature. They must feed on small animals stirred up as the manatee grazes. His tiny, almost ineffectual front fins helped him move along the bottom. Although he didn't scare off, I felt he was aware of us, for instead of grazing, he kept up a steady pace. We had only just managed to catch him each time he came up to breathe. He seemed such a gentle and harmless creature, and it was sad to think that manatee are on the verge of extinction due only to man. He looked so pathetic, his stubby little front fins appeared so useless compared to the whales and dolphins. Not the comparison is really valid, for one of his closest relatives is the elephant, a fact I personally find difficult to imagine. I felt he was getting a bit wary now. Perhaps the noise of Krov's camera was confusing him. Then, sculling with his great paddle tail, he disappeared. At last, our luck had changed. We both felt that the manatee had more than made up for the snapper. He'd also provided a strange and touching link with the past. Once Mayan hunted manatee, now they're nearly gone. We hoped they'd both survive. Before we left, the cycle of the seasons was complete. The rains which had been so long in coming had finally arrived. The rivers would swell and fill the lagoons once more. For the few remaining Mayans, Chalk had done his job well.